In this video, we're going to look at the first of the fundamental equations of fluid mechanics, based on the principle of conservation of mass. In our derivation, we are going to use the principle of control volumes. A control volume is a region in space bounded by a control surface. The size and the shape of a control volume are entirely arbitrary, but frequently they are made to coincide with solid boundaries, or are assumed to be normal to the flow to simplify derivation of the equations. A pipe provides us with one example where the choice of control volume is obvious. The inner surface of the pipe is taken as one of the boundaries, and the other two are plane surfaces perpendicular to the flow, one through which the fluid flows in, and the other through which it flows out. Similarly, for a channel, we use the bottom and sides of the channel and the free surface of the fluid to define the control surface. Now let's consider an arbitrarily shaped control volume of fluid. I will take the density to be rho and denote the control volume as Cv. The mass of fluid within the control volume can be obtained by integrating over the control volume. We have the integral over Cv of rho dv. Now, if the fluid is flowing, then the mass of fluid within the control volume may be changing. The rate of increase of mass is given by d by dt of the integral over cv of rho dv. Let's consider next the net rate of mass inflow to the control volume through the control surface. Let cs denote the control surface and let v be the velocity perpendicular to the control surface. Then the rate of mass inflow will be minus the integral over Cs of rho v dA. Note the minus sign appears here because the vector v is pointing outward from the control surface. We know that matter is conserved, and so the rate at which mass increases in Cv must equal the rate at which mass is flowing into Cv through Cs. Thus, d by dt of the integral over cv of rho dv equals minus the integral over cs of rho v dA. Rearranging this gives us this equation describing conservation of mass. To reiterate, this equation simply states that the rate of increase of mass within a control volume is equal so the net rate of mass inflow to the same control volume through the control surface. For a liquid of constant density, the mass of fluid within the control volume is constant, and thus the left-hand term in this equation is zero, and rho can come outside the integral on the right-hand side. In this case, the law of conservation of matter takes the form the integral over Cs of v dA equals zero, which is usually called the continuity equation. Let's consider now a portion of pipe as a control volume. There's no flow through the walls of a pipe, so the only flow is through the cross sections at either end of our control volume. Let's consider cross section one. The outflow will be minus u1 dA1 where the minus sign appears since the flow is going into the pipe at that cross-section. At cross-section 2, the outflow will be u2 dA2. Applying the continuity equation, we have... which yields the integral over u1 dA1 equals the integral of u2 dA2. We introduce the concept of discharge, or volumetric flow rate. The discharge, Q, is defined as the integral of u dA over the surface of a control volume. Now, the average velocity over a cross-section A 
is defined as u bar is 1 over a times the integral of u dA over a. Thus, by definition, u1 bar is 1 over a1 times the integral of u1 dA1, and u2 bar is 1 over a2 times the integral of u2 dA2. Thus, the continuity equation tells us that q equals u1 bar times a1, and that's equal to u2 bar times a2. Discharge is a very important concept in fluid mechanics, and it's often defined simply as average velocity times area. It has units of length cubed divided by time, which in SI units is metres cubed per second. What we have shown then is that for steady flow of an incompressible fluid, the continuity equation can be simply stated as discharge is constant. Because of the nature of the continuity equation and other conservation laws, cross-sectional area plays an important part in applying the equations. The most common ones we deal with in civil engineering are circular cross-sections for pipes and channels with rectangular or trapezoidal cross-sections. Note, in the case of channels, we have to be careful since the cross-sectional area of interest is defined by the depth of the water, not just by the dimensions of the channel. For channels that have a uniform width, we often use discharge per unit width, which is simply defined as discharge divided by the channel width, and is usually denoted by a lowercase q. The units of little q are length cubed divided by time and length, giving us metres cubed per second per metre, or metres squared per second. It's worth noting that in practice we often use discharge per unit width even for channels which are not truly rectangular. OK, so let's look at a problem we can solve using the continuity equation. Here we have two narrow pipes flowing into a single slightly larger pipe, and we want to find the average velocity at cross section 3 using known values of average velocity at cross sections 1 and 2. Note that we often dispense with the bar notation over the velocities to denote average velocity at a cross section, since we're dealing only with average velocities throughout. First, we need to calculate the areas at each cross section. We have a1 equals a2 equals 0.126 metres squared, and a3 equals 0.196 metres squared. The continuity equation tells us that the discharge in pipe 3 must equal the sum of the discharges in pipes 1 and 2. Thus we have a1v1 plus a2v2 equals a3v3. Dividing both sides of this equation by a3 gives us an expression for v3, and substituting the values we have calculated, we find that v3 equals 0.32 metres per second. In this second example, we're looking at a gradual constriction in a rectangular channel, and we know the channel widths and the incoming discharge per unit width. The diagram is giving us a view of the channel from above. Well, we know from conservation of mass that Q1 equals Q2, which we can rewrite in terms of discharge per unit width, giving us B1 times Q1 equals B2 times Q2. Rearranging for Q2, we have this expression, which gives us a discharge per unit width of 0.625 metres cubed per second per metre. 